Thank you, thank you. Hello, everybody. Hi, Hal. Hi, Larry. Hi. So Hal is, Hal is telling me that he dressed as a basic gay today. You if, have to mention that these are 1978 501 cut, which Levi's gave to me, because mm -hmm. I'm going to be in a documentary they're doing. But they're very different than today's pants the way they're cut. Yeah, yeah. And they're kind of as uncomfortable as they ever were, except you kind of, these pants, you know where everything is all the time. <laughs> so these are literally like out of the Levi's vault, right? They're, they're antiques. No, they're not antiques. They oh. make them oh, they for them. mere $270. Oh you can God. buy them. That's crazy. But Levi's gave them to me because anyone here who knows me knows that the chance of me spending Kind of money on them. So what, what's that documentary about? They're doing these web documentaries, but they, um, there's one segment on 501s, and they saw my photos, and so they mm. contacted me. They figured you were an expert. And that's how I knew I'd arrived, because they sent a car for me wow. to go down to Lima. So I wow. followed Bob Haas in the uh, filming. Fantastic. Very good. And apparently I was a lot more colorful. Than I'm me. sure they you were. They wanted me to have the color to the segment. So let's go back to the beginning. Uh, where, where are you from and how did you come to San Francisco? Well, I grew up outside Chicago, Highland Park, if anyone knows that. And uh, I came here to do my master's degree in photography at San Francisco State. So right off the bat, I wasn't really part of the gay migration because mm. I was, came for school purposes. Part of the art migration. Part of the art migration. Yeah. And that was 75, yeah. 1975. Yeah, and why did you come to SF State? Uh, I came to SF State, OK, first of all, full disclosure, I actually wanted to go to New York City. Mm. But there were no fine art photography programs in New York City at that point. Mm. So you had to go to Buffalo or Rochester. Mm -hmm. Neither of those places were didn't, my didn't appeal. Yeah. Well, I had done my undergraduate at the University of Illinois, and I mm -hmm. wanted to be in an urban environment. Mm -hmm. So, really, state, um, UCLA, mm -hmm. I mean, the Art Institute of Chicago, which I wouldn't have gone to because I grew up mm -hmm. outside Chicago. So I, I, came, to, I mm -hmm. came out here. And what was the, the focus of the program? Was it steeped in a kind of pictorialist fine art photography, or what, what was going on? You know, I, I've actually given a lot of thought to that because the two people that ran the pro program at that point, Jeff Wellpot and Don Worth, were very traditional photographers. I mean, one known mainly for landscape and flowers, and the other one for mm. portraits of people. Uh, and But they were faced with all of this experimentation that was going on photography. And when I think about the people that were in the program, there was probably with the exception of Catherine Wagner, I can't think of anyone that was actually doing what you would call traditional photography. And, and sort of as I think back on it, what I kind of admire when I think about Jack and Don is that they really rolled with mm. punches in terms of trying to, mm. you know, grapple is, with this and, mm -hmm. and understand it and accept it. Mm -hmm. So if the influences weren't coming from the faculty there, what work were you looking at that was steering you into well, this more conceptual direction? I had been doing alternative work, and I had been doing prints, big prints that were bleached that I drew and wrote on and things. Cause, and I'd actually been doing Before that. Before kind of, coming to San Francisco? I'd been doing that since college. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did almost all through my graduate program. But at the same time, I was very fortunate to have met Lou Thomas. Mm -hmm. and. Really, Lou Thomas is my mentor. Mm -hmm. So I, tell us about Lou Thomas. He is such an important figure, and too few people know about him. Well, Lou was a, still is. He still is alive and lives up in Petaluma now. But he um, really was is a theorist, and he ran the bookstore at the Legion of Honor, and he sort of ran it like an atelier. He would buy all these books, all these theory books, and had all these artist friends and things, and he, he really influenced a lot of people. What, what happened with me with him is that 
and this is actually very pivotal to my work, is that right after I got here, I started writing for Art Week. And uh, I reviewed Lou's work, and I got a letter from him, because in those days, people actually wrote letters and communicated with letters and responded about reviews and things. And it started this discussion, and he saw my work, and he was interested, but then, like he did with other people, he started turning me on to reading things. And, and really, the whole genesis of this actually started with Jack Burnham's book, The Structure of Art. And, and all of this, to put it in a broader level, is really kind of re recycled French structuralism. And the same things that, you know, in the early 60s were influencing Susan Sontag's writing, would think, and it had, that it also just influenced novels and people like Robbery and this whole basically anti-metaphor way of looking at things. Lou was introducing that into photography. And he was introducing it to be introduced here, which was this, really this bastion of traditional mm -hmm. photography. I mean, the whole F64 tradition. I mean, that was so alive and well when I moved here, and the whole mystique. And, and he was really moving in this other direction. And most of the people, the few people that were writing, well, actually, the only two people that were writing about photography were Marjorie Mann and Joan Murray. I mean, they didn't know what to make of this stuff. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what to make of it, but I took it seriously. And, mm -hmm. you know, at the very least, as a, as a writer and a reviewer, could respond to it viscerally. And, mm -hmm. you know, and, it, and it's still something that when I think about Lou's work and see it and see that he's getting recognition, there's still a physicality to his work that I find incredibly appealing. Mm -hmm. I, I think his work is beautiful. Yeah. I, I think it's really yeah. fantastic. We own a piece at the museum that's just very poetic, ironically. Um, um, so you were working with applying language or words to, fo to photographs before you met Lou. Yeah. But yeah. what was the nature of that? Was it more in kind of the Dwayne Hansen narrative kind of text? Uh, you know, it was all over the map. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, there were things that I was taking out of the newspaper and writing mm -hmm. on things. There was uh, uh, some of it was very Magritte, like I had a, picture was actually a traditional picture of a canoe against a wall, very silvery, and I bleached out and done a big and, a, and written a J canoe on it. Mm. So mm. it was kind of all over the map. Mm -hmm. um, so it sounds like in that example that you've just given, you are already working with this, the, the idea of an, of an equivalence between the photo and, and the text, totally. which is really was the underlying idea, I think, of uh, what Lou was getting at and many of the, the artists here at that time with the so-called yeah. photography and language yeah, thing. Totally. But what you learned from Lou, I guess, and the readings that he introduced you to just deepened that initial And instinct. he was doing that with a lot of people, mm -hmm. uh, and certainly with Donna Lee Phillips. I mean, I think myself and Donna Lee are probably the two that were the closest. And then there's also Peter D'Agostino, mm -hmm. who falls a little bit more into the media, mm -hmm. more into the media area. Mm -hmm. And I think for me also, I was very, I was very attuned to being a photographer. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. when you look at this work, I still wanted to make a fine print. I wanted mm -hmm. a different aesthetic, so I would go mm -hmm. to a more extended uh, grayscale. Mm -hmm. I, um, liked printing on RC paper because it did not mm. have the richness and the connotation of silver gel in the paper. Mm. And I would put these pictures up and the writing and where you, it was all about the distance mm. that where you would read the text mm. and where you would see the image. But at the end of the day, these were, these were photos. There was no, mm. Nobody could argue. They were mm. photos in a, physically in a very traditional mm. sense. So was there any debate at that time that you recall maybe with Lou or Donna Lee or Peter about this, these affective qualities and whether they were legitimate in a theoretical framework or whether it was best to just make the sign and be done with it? No. No? <laughs> oh. First I have to see if I understand that question. But, uh, you know, um, I think that you know, there may be people here, there are a few people here, a couple of people here that could respond to that. I don't remember sitting around mm. having long 
mm -hmm. theoretical mm -hmm. conversations mm -hmm. about anything. Mm -hmm. Now mm -hmm. there's a possibility that, mm -hmm. I don't remember doing that with Lou, mm -hmm. but I remember him responding to my work mm -hmm. and, and really giving, and it was just this sort of key direction in the beginning, mm -hmm. and then I kind of like just mm -hmm. went with it. So Lou's there holding court at the bookstore at the De Young, which is the such Legion. a the Legion, the Legion, even we, even weirder. Down in this That's so strange. Yeah. And he was running it as a kind of theory and critique atelier. He was running it very under the administration did finally catch on to it. Uh -huh. but, and then it was over. Well, I had this other connection because I got my first museum job uh -huh. at the Fine Arts Museum, uh -huh. and I worked uh -huh. at the Legion. Uh -huh. So we overlapped. Yeah. So what was the, um, beyond the, the bookstore at the Legion and your writing at Art Week, what were the other institutional points in the constellation of your life and, and the, the art life of these other folks who were doing similar work? What were the, the alternative spaces or galleries? Well, it was camera work. Mm. Um, and, it was, and what it was was that a man named John Lampkin had started camera work. It actually, when I first started reviewing, it was out in Fairfax, in like a shot in the strip mall. Wow. It was really kind of trippy. Amazing. And then he got, I know it's not, uh, a loft at, uh, I want to say Fifth and Folsom. The building mm -hmm. got destroyed in 89, mm -hmm. the quake. And he would do juried shows. This was a, a, something, again, I think that's sort of historically been lost, but a lot of what you did in the 70s is there were these shows like New Photographics up in Ellensburg, Washington, and you would pay it a you know, fee, mm -hmm. very small fee, and you'd send your work. And that's kind of how you built up your, mm -hmm. your resume. And so John was doing that. Mm -hmm. And a group of people, and I think Lou was fair, was quite central to this, convinced John that this could be bigger. This mm -hmm. could, and at that time, Carl Loeffler, mm -hmm. who created La Mamelle, uh, and it's kind of nice when I look out because there's different people out mm -hmm. here I know that could actually add more to this mm -hmm. yeah. conversation on a couple levels than I than I could. Carl is a subject unto himself. Mm -hmm. um, and Lama Mel started as a, as a journal, a publication, and then turned into a gallery. I, what, I, I was it was, did it start as a journal or as a space? It started as Both. a space. Okay. started as a space. And yeah. a wonderful bookstore that David Highsmith ran, actually. But it was a big space, and mm. I think Carl, uh, he, you know, he needed, he needed some, someone else to move mm. in there. So this push was to convince John Lampkin that that camera work should move in there. We were all like very mm. enthusiastic. Mm. And as it turned out simultaneously, there's three things were happening that day. One is I had just finished my MA. Mm. Two, I was co-curating the Eros and Photography show with Donnelly Phillips, which again was one of these jury shows where people mm. had sent mm -hmm. work. This was also, before my museum career, had the greatest curatorial disaster of my life with that show. Because mm. what had happened was uh, that we, everything was set to go. I went to Mexico after I, I got my MA just for a week, I come back discovered that John Lampkin has like fled. Mm. The whole thing freaked him out. None of the walls got built. Mm. And we're trying to move this, and we're supposed to be opening a show. Mm -hmm. So everybody sort of got together, got, mm. got the walls up. Mm -hmm. And the, the curatorial disaster part was that I, um, we had hundreds of works. I don't know where Donna Lee was. She of course mm. disappeared. I'm left with these mm. works. And I literally had to make the decision we're only hanging the largest works because mm. we're just, we'll be going for weeks with this mm. thing. So That's a kind of curatorial yeah. decision. So we got them up. And back in the, those days, I mean, people really went to things. So, I mean, we were hanging works right yeah. up to the moment of the opening. And there was like 200 people outside mm -hmm. the door. Well, of course, all hell broke loose. Because then people came in, they'd been told they were in the show, their mm, work wasn't up. Terrible. Donnelly wasn't to be found until she came back and decided that I had, you know, so, you know, gone above mm. her and done what I wanted to do. God I was hell. trying to get the work on. What a nightmare. So, yeah, it was a nightmare. What year, was this 76, 77? This was 77. Uh -huh. This was January 77. Uh -huh. So, um, 
I didn't have another curatorial nightmare until 1989 yeah. when oh. I was doing oh. a show of icons from yeah. Soviet Georgia. Oh. I wouldn't give them to me when I got right. there. Right. Okay. Yeah. But that was a whole other story. Was anyone any, was anyone here in the audience one of the people who thought they were in that show and then and then you you really were you thought you were in and you went and you weren't your work wasn't up. No, Camel Work came in 77. Well, when did the photography and running show? That was La Mamel doing the show. Oh, La Mamel did, La did, the, the, did the show in the whole space. Okay, so, the publication had a, a connection. Yeah, with yeah, but that okay. was all. In terms of yeah. place, then. Yeah, so we got into the space, and then of course, what to do. So I actually created Camel Work's first board. Mm. And I went out and told each of the 20 people they had to give $100. Mm -hmm. Good, good which first was a lot move. Of money in those yeah. Yeah. And my first successful development effort. And uh, so we had $2,000, and that basically paid for the rent mm -hmm. and for Craig Morey's salary, who I talked into mm -hmm. being director Great. very unwillingly. Um, and so that, that covered us for six months. Fantastic. And then this work, um, what was the genesis of this project? I was actually, I mean, it, it makes sense given the, all the things we've been talking about of the, the you know, the, the theoretical framework and everything, but then in, among the ephemera over there is the interview you did with someone from the, the Sentinel, and you said that it really was about um, dealing with your, you know, your inability to relate to people, and it was a, that, something like that. You said it was, it was, I the, the, didn't read it before they told them to put it in the case. You said something like taking photographs helped you, you know, to, yeah, have human relationships or something. You said it, it's in there. I don't have an inability to do it. Well, well, you did my, then. I did, no, I did. My <laughs> default position is just to yell at them. There's several people here who could testify to that, too. Um, oh, God knows what I said. But really, Seriously, I mean, I started with the signifiers, and you know, I'm sure because of Lou's encouragement, you know, that he just really was say go with it, and then it just became a project, and the entire body of work was done in about six months. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was very, very quick, mm -hmm. and it was, and it received a lot of recognition. Mm -hmm. It got NEA grants. It mm -hmm. got NCAA. Yeah, that's amazing. You know, it was not, but but you know. The same thing too is like, and it's so funny because Mark Rennie's here, who was the Eyes and Ears Foundation, and that's was the genesis of the billboard, mm -hmm. and that was that had NEA funding. Yeah, I mean, could you imagine them doing that billboard now? The NEA doesn't incredible. the NEA even do anything. Some know. something, yeah. but this was not even, if if my mind is working correctly, not even ten years after Stonewall, right? I mean, this was no. this this was really still in a cultural environment, maybe not in San Francisco, but nationally that it, it's, it is amazing that this work was funded and got off the ground. Well, it also went places. Like, I had a show pretty early on, maybe 1980, at like James Madison University. Mm -hmm. Of Virginia. this work, this yeah, work traveled yeah, there. Was, mm -hmm. I mean, it went to a lot of places. Mm -hmm. and, and truly, I mean, Lou saw the, saw the work, and it was the show at Los in the Cell Gallery, and he says, you've got to do a book. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, uh, how do you make 24 photos into a book? Mm -hmm. And I have to give enormous amount of mm -hmm. credit. To, I mean, that book is Lou and Donna Lee. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like mm -hmm. a three-way mm -hmm. project. Mm -hmm. So when you were doing this project, did you have it all figured out from the beginning, the different, the different components? So how, how did it evolve? What led to what, and what well, was your thought process? Funny. Well, unfortunately, at that time, there were other things affecting my thought process. Uh. So, how much memory is still I, I left see. from that period is anybody's guess. Uh -huh. uh, the best I can do usually is look at my contact sheets because I actually was fairly organized and dated them. And I, I, it would have been the signifiers first, and I believe uh. it was, I don't archetypes or street fashion next, and then it sort of kept going in mm -hmm. further, you know, and uh, and. There does seem to me that there is a, a certain irony or humor in this work, very, albeit very dry. It's very Jewish. Very Jewish. Yes. Yeah, so, 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 tell me about this. The Jew. The Jew. The Jewish. Ju <laughs> well, I'm bald. You're bald. 
Is this like a, yeah, is this like Borscht Belt translated into structuralist you know, idiom? I feel, yeah, but I don't think it was conscious. I mm. mean, I think it was, I mean, the part that was conscious was the strategy is, is that, I mean, it, it's the exact opposite of Maplethorpe. Mm -hmm. the, it was not, when you look at the, his early work, the, the goal was not to have people, I was not really pushing people. It was mm -hmm. much more subversive of how you use humor, you know, how you make photos. All these photos, in their own way, are, are, have some level of very deliberate artifice. Mm -hmm. And the text, which a lot of it really ends with like a one-liner, mm -hmm is really to Punch disarm them. people, mm. not, not to, you know, threaten them, mm -hmm. not to, and so I think it, it's, in that sense, it was very, I think the work was really celebratory, and it was celebratory of the culture and the community that I was in. It was not an anthropological, we're going to do gay people of the 20th century, mm -hmm. all, um, August Sander, it was, mm -hmm. it was a very specific, I mean, one writer described it as like a family snapshot. Mm -hmm. Right, but you did tell me when we met in your studio a week or two ago that Sander was an inspiration totally. on a certain level. Yeah. Totally, I mean that body of work. Mm -hmm. Right, and, and uh, the Beshers also, and I don't see any of that work as being ironic or humorous at, at no, all. No, no, no. But, uh, but I think the text, and I mean when you look at that work, I mean that's not real. I mean mm -hmm. lighting, mm -hmm. right. uh, mm -hmm. you know, the tacky stuff, and mm -hmm. um, you know, I definitely, that middle picture there really is, it was it's mm -hmm. such a takeoff of 19th century sculpture, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know right. Give the captain. Mm -hmm. like right, that. right. So another thing that, that uh, I know in, in the trajectory of your work, and it's a little bit hard to sense just seeing this one body of work, but you talked about in our studio visit, I, I think you, you used the term the disintegration of the image or the devolution or the disappearance of the, of the image. Can you talk a little bit about that and if you see that already happening in this work and how that played out in your subsequent projects? I think what I was talking about is that was a trajectory within the whole photography mm -hmm. and language sensibility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I don't like to use the, the word photography language group. I don't mm -hmm. like to say movement because mm -hmm. it, it wasn't any of those things. Mm -hmm. You know, it was not, I don't believe anybody came together with a manifesto, mm -hmm. but it was both, a, but it was a different way of looking at photographs, it was a different way of making photographs, mm -hmm. it was a different way of talking about photographs. Mm -hmm. So some people here might not be familiar with this, this idea of the photography and language. Uh, so there was a show and a book called Photography and Language, yeah. and you, well, weren't even, you weren't even in, in that. I was. Oh, you were. No, I didn't quite, I knew I, not the book, but I was in the show. You're right, you weren't in the book, because which I is so weird. I just found a review in Lama Mel, and there was one of my pictures. How come you're not in the book? Lou begged me to write something for the book. He uh -huh. begged me, and I just was really busy, and uh -huh. I just couldn't do it. But I think, but here's an example, because we need to talk about the photography in my show. It had very rigid curatorial parameters in the sense that everything had to be an 8 by 10 inch right. horizontal image. Mm -hmm. And it was all hung like butt next to each other all the mm -hmm. way around the walls. So like there was one there. line all yeah. the way around? Yeah. Um, so, you know, and again, that, when you just think about that thing of, of where it was placing the individual practitioner mm -hmm. in relationship to other words. I mean, right. obviously no mounting, no maps, mm -hmm. no nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, it was just, just out there. Mm -hmm. The thing that I touched on when we were talking about is, I think this is a double-edged sword, because I mm -hmm. think on one, I think the impact of photographic language and what, what happened is, I mean, Lou, I mean, he had been publishing books earlier. He did a little book of his own work called The Thinker, uh, he did a book of his daughter Case's drawings. I mean, he had mm. done things, uh, but the photography and language book was a first, but then you know, there was Eros and, there was mm. my book, there was Eros and Photography, and these things really went out, mm, right. out into, uh, and Peter's book, they, were, they went out into the mainstream, and so there was a great impact. What I think happened, though, and this, this could be argued, and when I say impact, I mean, like, 
Richard Mizrak was part of this discussion at one point. I remember meeting in his studio and mm. he did some broadside things. So you, mm -hmm. you know, and Lutz Bacher. Yeah, and, and you know, I I met Cindy Sherman and Bob Lala mm -hmm. because I was going and lecturing at Bayer at the time of being on my own. Mm -hmm. So this was getting getting out, and people were particularly interested in what was happening in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. So educators were this, but what I think ultimately happened is that this devolved into people making less and less visually interesting photographs. Because it became so steeped in a theory and... I think and so, that, and it mm. became so theory-based, and it just, it just, and I gotta say, I look back through some of these books, I mean, the energy is great, but how many of the pictures are really mm. particularly compelling, or mm. that I want to revisit, mm. or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, is... Right, and so in your own practice, how, was there a trajectory, uh, and it came to an end fairly quickly too, and yes, I want to hear about that. Well, it's, there was, the, I mean, you know, part of being a writer, and I was doing more and more criticism, and being sort of an overthinking mm. Jew, mm. is that this can really work against you. Mm. You know, when, when you're making art, I think. Mm. So I was very aware when I did this body of work because, again, you know, it's, I mean, this has been rediscovered. Partially, I put it away. I mm -hmm. went on to do other things for a few decades. But I knew at the time that I did it that I had hit something, that something had occurred on a cultural, mm -hmm. personal, conceptual, practical level. Mm -hmm. And I have, Anybody as an artist that this happens once to is really lucky. Mm. And I thought, this ain't ever gonna happen again. Mm. Didn't stop me from making work, because then I went on to do the Castro Street mm. piece, uh, mm -hmm. which was you know, taking my work into more of a performance genre. Mm -hmm. Again, for those of you who don't know, I, there was a bench on, Ca on 18th right near Castro, and I photographed it every hour on the hour for 24 hours. And um, from exactly the same spot, mm -hmm. sort of the background, kind of mm -hmm. and wrote a little paragraph on what was going on in each hour. Many of the things involved what I was doing during the hour. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I've always liked that kind of summation uh, of things, you know, encapsulating, mm -hmm. making things mm -hmm. tight. And uh, so I did that piece, and then I did my boyfriend's piece, mm -hmm. which is still one of my favorite. I, I used to be sleeping with people and photographing them. I don't mm -hmm. know, just something about People did a lot of photo, you know, just, well, like they do now with their phones. Oh, I'll take a picture. Mm -hmm. So I went through the contact sheets and I pulled out all these pictures and printed black bands over their eyes. And then I and wrote, wrote a little something. I would write a story. Mm -hmm. I mean, a true story, but it was mm -hmm. again, this On the photo was again. Just, oh, no, those, those weren't on the photo, it was below, so you separated yeah, it out. And it yeah. was typeset, wasn't mm -hmm. handwritten. Right. And this again was sort of the Sonder thing mm. that I wanted, uh, I wanted each of these things to be an archetype of a certain mm. kind of interaction that I don't think were unique to me, mm. but the gay men were having. Mm -hmm. So those, and you did give them sort of generic titles, like yeah. the, like what are some examples of the boyfriend? The waiter. The, waiter, the, the German visitor. Uh -huh. Yeah, <laughs> right, the German visitor. We've all had one. Yeah, yeah. Well, 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 we're all having a lot of things. In yeah. Right. Uh, so, uh, but I see when I'm when I'm being critical of the photo language, I see happening in my own work. Like you saw, there's a piece, my city hall piece, mm -hmm. which is three pictures of city hall, mm -hmm. but with different text below each mm -hmm. one. The, they have the same pi the same picture yeah. of city hall, but the texts are about three different moments yeah. before the. One, one is the, the day of the assassination. One is the day of the assassinations, one is a gay pride. Mm -hmm. and the other one, I think, was about the Briggs Initiative and mm -hmm. Peter Bryant. And, and then I kind of went completely the opposite way mm -hmm. to this piece that you saw about mm -hmm. being in Europe. Right, very po poetic yeah, and romantic. Where I was practically mm -hmm. writing poetry. Mm -hmm. But the truth is, I, I had become so engaged in the criticism. Mm -hmm. um, and I. You know, it was a slow process of giving it up. Mm -hmm. I, didn't, mm -hmm. I didn't really regret it, though it was really fascinating when I started to resurrect mm -hmm. this, you know, because mm -hmm. I sort of went back and went, you know, kind of like, now what 
would happen if mm. it stayed with mm. us. Mm. And there, there's two poles of it, and especially because the street fashion is one of my favorite bodies of work. I would have liked a portrait photographer. I mean, I, mm. I love, I mean, I didn't costume these people, mm. I didn't stage them, but my, the attentive to, to how you interact, and I still like taking pictures, I just take them with my mm. iPhone mm. now. Mm. Uh, I like that interaction, but when I thought about it, I thought, well, I could do this with my subculture, but I just, mm. I can't imagine going into other cultures, mm. and first of all, using this kind of humor. Mm. Right. And, so, and interestingly, I think at some levels, it, it turned out to be a blessing that I stopped when I did, because I would have had to confront AIDS. Mm. And I, I don't know how mm. I would have done that. Mm. I can't imagine, my, I'm not David Warner Robins from mm. shot. Mm. And I don't think my, you know, I, I got a pass on that. Mm -hmm. I dealt with it the way everybody yeah. else dealt with it with friends, but, but I don't think that you could be a gay person, be an artist at that point, mm -hmm. and not deal mm -hmm. with it. Yeah. So that piece in Europe was sort of the last full body of work, and what was the date of that? 1979. 79, yeah. So only two years after this. Yeah. It was only two more I had years. Good, good run. Though. Yeah, you know, you did very, very good. And then, what what led to this uh, revisiting? What? How did how did this come about? Well, as one of my friends who's here, Woody Glenn, another artist, he said, I, back in the day, I put it all away. And mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the critic part is that this will this will come back at some point. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, and I just put it away, and I went went on with things. And really. The main thing was the show under the big black sun. Mm -hmm. It was done at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. and SF MoMA had recommended me to them. Mm -hmm. And so my work went into that show. And I became very aware that there was, that was a, it was a show that went, covered 1974 to 1981, and it was all media, and it was, it was a really extraordinary show. It was a curatorial mm -hmm. hot mess on mm -hmm. a number of levels, mm -hmm. including the right people with the wrong pieces. And mm -hmm. I mean, it was just like crazy. But the energy of the work in that show mm -hmm. and the experimentation was extraordinary. So it was, and then, you know, people saw that work. Was it this piece that they included in that show? They had some of the, uh, the handkerchiefs piece, mm. I think signifiers from L response, the billboard mock-up, mm. the bill, a billboard installation photo, mm. that was the basic, um, I mean, it was a real cattle call on the show, mm. I and mean, it was all over the place. And then some stuff was requested for a show in Krakow, and, mm. and um, it had always been my, my desire that the work would go to SF MoMA. They, owned some of it, they owned a couple pieces that had been donated, they had shown the work of Lou had curated a show of photography and words in mm -hmm. 1982, and we each got like, it was like seven individual shows, because we, we each mm -hmm. got in a room to ourselves, mm -hmm. so, you know, they've been incredibly supportive mm -hmm. and open about it, and my pieces would periodically come up like in the mm -hmm. 50th anniversary mm -hmm. show. Mm -hmm. So finally, um, not going into too much detail, but I, I, it was time to approach them. Mm. And they had, they knew the work, but they didn't know the, they came over, they didn't know the mm. full extent. Mm. And uh, they got very excited. Mm. So they acquired right. the work mm. and then they said, you know, well, we, we, we want to introduce this gallerist to your work. Mm. Mm. The big surprise to me, as I say, there's three, I always expected us at the moment to get the work. I never expected to be paid for it. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was the first mm -hmm. surprise. The second surprise is that because of the way these prints were made, uh, which was me writing, press typing on acetate, mm -hmm. and printing the negative through the acetate, mm -hmm. that I always assumed once the vintage work was gone, it was gone. And essentially through the miracles of digital photography, we were able to, um, recreate the work and do mm. a new portfolio mm. Mm. of it. And the truth of the matter is these prints are, they're on a paper that's identical in surface and everything to the 1977 mm. paper, but the images are better. Mm. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, it was easier. And 
the scale is the same. Everything is the same. same. You can put, I, SF Noma has been very involved in mm -hmm. it, so they mm -hmm. have played a quality control mm -hmm. um, role in this. And it's, it's, I joke about it, but you know, it's, it was in the Chronicle, I said that I manage the estate of Helen Fisher, because mm -hmm. I can't refer to myself as mm -hmm. an artist, I'm not paying mm -hmm. for art. But the part of this that's really intellectually interesting to me is you do have to make decisions. And um, one of the things that happened with this, because there was, there's been issues about archival paper from the 70s, of RC paper from the 70s and it's archival. So we went to do this work and we printed it on basically just regular Archer's mm. stock. And everybody was fine until the curator saw it. Like, mm. oh, no, no, this mm. has to be glossy. Mm. So we threw all those prints out, mm. the scanning, and, right. and started all over again. Um, but each, each work is like reconsidering. I mean, there's the billboard installation mm -hmm. photo in there, which there's no way that would have been, I would have done a print mm -hmm. of that size. So I think each body of work, and you have to sort of have this discussion with yourself, but also with other people about, I mean, this has come up with Castor Street, because I have a portfolio. And Castor Street exists in various uh, physical formats, and so I've done it. Even from back in the day, yeah, you did it yeah, four times. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's been done with 16 by mm. 20 inch prints mm. of the image and then the text below. The first piece was seven 18 by 24 mm. inch panels with photo and text. Mm. And, you know, so you know, talking to them and saying, well, it's fine now to put, you know, they think to put the photos and the mm. text on one mm. field. Right. You know, um, but back in the day, that was, you know, right. really difficult, difficult or to expensive do. thing right. to do. I mean, I couldn't afford right. that. Right. Well, I'd like to, there's so many people here who know so much about all these things we've been talking about and can add more information, so maybe we can just open it up to questions or comments if anybody wants to add uh, pieces to this puzzle of, of history, which is familiar to some of you, but completely new to others, so we're all ready to hear and learn more. So anybody, we have a, but wait for the mic. I think we're recording for posterity, is that right? Questions? That's all right. Yes, we have a question over here. All right. Good. Thank you. So I was just wondering, what's the name of the font that you used? Do you remember? Font I used. Or did did you have any particular? Well, the big deal. But you didn't play with type too much, or you just kind of. What this is press type, right? So that's handwriting, and then I just had my sheets of press type. Oh right. Yeah. So the nothing was ever set oh, for this for this series. Other people? Yeah. Robert. Hi guys. Hi Robert. I think Larry's question was really good about uh, Borschtbelt, and you might think of Susan Sontag's comment about a key components of 20th century sensibility as being homosexual aesthetic irony and Jewish moral earnestness, which I think applies to you and mm -hmm. maybe Woody Allen too. But also, I mean, I think as you talk about this, it made me think about John Goodman and other people who used to be at San Francisco State, but also the whole idea of constructing schools in a place where there are, are not, where there, there's such an emphasis on this at the time, at the kind of end of modernism. And your work seems completely remote to me from someone's like blues in the sense that you could, you could assign semiotic names to the guys you would have sex with, but to me this seems like a romantic, very personal narrative that comes directly out of your life and ultimately kind of unites these few bodies of work that you've done more than the, you know, I think that work, it's always interesting knowing how, how things change and I think clearly that work impacted on you. But I did also want to know about if 
John Goodman was still around when you were at State. Oh, he was a teacher, but I mean, I knew John and was actually involved because Lou was the one that really brought John's work back and actually Lou brought me in to write some stuff early on for NEA grants and that. And, uh, and I actually set up John's trust for the San Francisco, you know, when I went to the San Francisco Foundation, which is still doing artist grants. Hmm. So, but I think that, you know, your point is there is definitely romanticism in my work and in different pieces it comes out more or less in the same way that there is actually a lot of autobiography embedded in this work. Occasionally I do take people on the sex tour of who I slept with in these pictures. Um, <laughs> the first time that you think of, um, who's the, I think it was the other thing, it's not yet anymore, um, the photographer, this is the last name, it's a Goldberg, you know, or just Jim uh, Goldberg. Jim Goldberg. Jim, Jim Goldberg. Um, you know, in a certain way, even those were the, though they were the comments of people he was interviewing, this is a photographer who did these great photographs for the people in, in SROs, writing their reactions and their handwriting to write on his prints um, or wealthy people and the Zipkites. And they're really kind of wonderful pictures. But those, those two seem very personal to me. I mean, maybe it has to do with this, the whole editing and selection that goes into photography, which seems so akin to writing to me. Is there a question there? Is there a question? No, uh, no. Well, it's so great to see them here. I tell you, it's been that many years since I saw them last time. So that's fantastic. Anyway, um, two connections. One certainly a good one. We get back to that. Bush uh, Belt. <coughs> There's actually another connection. 
because oh, please, yeah. oh. well, for the billboard photo, uh, not the mock-up, not the actual billboard, but I had photographed the billboard as it was being installed, and it was a set, I don't know how many total, but it was very much a, you know, a benefit kind of thing, you know, I was doing the same mm. thing, and when we decided we would do the billboard here, because we didn't do it in my Los Angeles show, um, I was trying to do a triptych and it didn't work, and all of a sudden I pulled up that one photo, and of course, I've only seen that photo eight by 10, you know, and again, the, the miracle of digitizing from the negative. And we, the title I gave it is Billboard, an installation, you know, an installation, but, or an installation, you know, what I've installation so on. But the truth is, when I look at the subtitles, it's homage to John Goodman. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. I looked at the mm -hmm. picture, and I mean, what makes that picture, and I, I've gotten a lot of really positive feedback on that picture, but all of that that's going on with the signs in that picture, I mean, it's one mm -hmm. of the things, because that's something I never, I never lived with that picture. I mean, these I lived with, I know them, but that one I've, I've gotten a certain kind of joy out of because mm -hmm. I'm experiencing it, but I, but yeah. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Um, so I suspect, I could be wrong, there may be some people here who aren't, aren't aware who John Goodman is, a uh, fantastic photographer. Uh, began in Europe, as, as Peter was saying, and came to San Francisco. And if you're not aware of his work, look it up. Great, great artist who was a fixture in this community. And Peter D'Agostino, who's been talking, uh, is one of the uh, compatriots of this era who uh, contributed a great deal to this, the, the culture at that time in this, in this area. Right, yeah. So I want to ask, you, you were talking about distance and how the, the text helps to create a particular distance between the, the viewer or the reader and the work. And that distance is actually not a lot. Like you draw the people in. You, you, it's not the, the usual distance at which you read a photograph. It's closer. So was part of that about getting people who might not be comfortable with this image and sort of rubbing their nose in it in a way? And no, I mean, I think, I think that, first of all, The idea was not to do images that would make people uncomfortable. I mean, even, it's funny, because the most problematic series was that, and I started to look through old contact sheets, I go, like, The Natural with my friend Stephen. I had to do it twice, because the first set of pictures, I realized, was too exposed. Mm. Uh, I had to do the classical nude twice, because the first guy mm. that I photographed just didn't really have a good body. Uh, I know, it's very unfortunate. And I, I, you know, I forgot all this stuff, and then I'm looking. But, um, you know, somebody said to me, and again, like the bondage devices, which on a formal level are photographs that I actually really like mm -hmm. formally. You know, well, sometimes, well, why didn't she use a real person? Because a real person in that would have just been so, I mean, just, it would have made it too real. Mm. And the way I did it is I actually did photograph a real person. And Craig Morey, Camworks first director, posed for them in mm. those things. Mm. And then I just did the drawings. I have a set of, set of those devices with nothing in it, and then a mm. set with him in mm. it. But the whole idea was not, it was not to put mm. people off. It was not to, oh, I don't want to deal with that. So the text, because you, you have to get up close. Mm. And I think. What I was saying about the text is that I was so into finding a way to make the text part of the image because I wanted this to be a traditional photographic image, which it still is, and the, the text is in it. But that you bring people in and then you create this intimate experience. And then you mm -hmm. start talking about what, for some people, was pretty weird stuff mm -hmm. to be reading about. And then you start coming up with a punchline to mm -hmm. disarm mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. that, that's how I, I meant it. Good. So one more question? Yeah. Rudy. Well, you know I'm a big fan of your work. And I have your first book on my bookshelf. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I was really interested in maybe hearing you talk a little bit about, not so much the Borscht Belt humor, but this is, to me, I had this epiphany. When, and I've had your book on my bookshelf for so long. But just when I saw this show here, I started really thinking of it in terms of drag. And it's completely camp. And, um, and I see it like in terms of, say, drag kings that Kathy Opie photographed. 
I can see them right next to this, so I was wondering if you wanted to address that at all. Because I actually, and you said it in your interview in After Image, that you knew just a little bit enough to make you dangerous or something about Sontag and Bart. And I took you at your word for it then for the first time. I thought, these are funny. These are camp. These are ironic. And, they're, and it lifted me out of this pretty heavy theoretical mm -hmm. frame that I would always mm -hmm. had you in and saw you kind of in a different light, which really mm -hmm. complements each other, I mean, both sides. So I was wondering if you had any comment about that. Um, well, the truth is I've never, the Borscht Belt comment is interesting, but I think in a way it's a little too easy. You know, I think the Jewish, you know, they're, it's, it's much, I mean, when you start thinking about the gay culture and humor and survival and things, it's, mm -hmm. it, there's a much more profound level than just mm -hmm. writing it off as a mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And this work to me was utterly celebratory. I mean, this is about, you know, this is like within a year and a half of me coming out of the closet mm. or whatever. So, and celebrating, and I think that was so much in nature of the community too that I could do that. I mean, what what separated me was, you know, from a lot of people who were doing work, many of whom I fought with because I reviewed them, but um, was that I had met Lou and I was approaching it, you know, theoretically, where I think that, you know, most of the, and I mean theoretically, I don't mean that as much as there's a conceptual premise and the way I'm using text is just a different way than the people that were doing very straight documentation of what was going on. And I think other people that were photographing but in a very romanticized way and giving legitimacy to relationships and things. And you know me, I mean, in my 20s, I was pretty, pretty hard on all that stuff. Uh, but in the 70s, people were hard. I mean, the way they talked to one another. I mean, I pull out these letters. I mean, I, I was telling people, I pulled out one of them, a letter Lou wrote to Robert Heineken, ripping him a new one about the NEI. I was like, whoa. Uh, you know, I mean, people were very direct and they were very passionate. And again, it was one of the things that caused me to move out of all this because mm. starting in the 80s, people became a lot less passionate. They mm. became a lot more careerist. I mean, nobody was making any money in the mm -hmm. 70s, so it's great. I mean, we could all argue about the real things, and then it just, mm -hmm. it really morphed into this other thing. The funny thing about camp is that when I did my MFA in critical theory at UCSD, I wrote the first part of my thesis on Frank O'Hara, and I always had trouble dealing with camp and understanding it, and I always saw it as a really, one of a better word, white Gentile thing that didn't have anything to do with me. So it's, it's interesting to hear that, that you say that at this point. But I really struggled with it with him, you know, when I was really studying his poetry and writing about it. Okay. One, one more? Are you raising your hand? No? no? Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Hal. That was very illuminating. Really wonderful.